This session is on comorbidities and chronic heart failure. For this session, which is a two hour session, we have moderators, Dr. Jay Shankar, Dr. Satya Murthy, and Dr. Manokar. We start off today's proceedings with a recap of the day four session by Professor Ayengar, which is for 15 minutes. This will be followed by a talk on uh, advanced heart failure, that is mechanical circulatory support by me. This is 20 minutes, followed by a talk on chronic heart failure by Dr. V.K. Chopra. Next up, we have valvular heart disease and heart failure by Dr. Ajay Behel. And then we have two case scenarios by Dr. Anu George Alex. The questions can come in at any time. You can post them in the chat box and uh, myself as the coordinator and the moderators will take them as and when possible and also at the end of each session. The proceedings will now be handed over to Dr. Jay Shankar, Dr. Satya Murthy and Dr. Manokar to take it forward. I invite Professor Ayengar to give us a recap of day four's proceedings. Professor Ayengar, sir. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening once again. We had uh, five excellent talks last week by these uh, five highly experienced cardiologists in this field. And I'll try to summarize these findings for you. Please note that most of these conditions were reversible causes of heart failure. Officer Ambujarai started with uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, and we gave a definition that uh, heart failure in the last month of pregnancy or within five months of delivery. I also made a point that 20% of cases present during the second and third trimester prior to last gestation. Of course, the LVF has to be less than 45%. The incidence is pretty high in uh, countries like Nigeria, Haiti, and in India, the incidence has been reported to be one in 1,374 live births. The risk factors for this PPCM or peripartum cardiomyopathy are African American race, preeclampsia, hypertension, high metal knowledge, multi gestational pregnancy, and a genetic background. Management options during uh, pregnancy one has to be careful about use of these drugs beta blockers, loop diuretics, hydrazine, nitrates, digoxin, domiclovir, piparin, or permitted. But one should not use ACE inhibitors, ARBs, elder stone receptor antagonists, ARNI, or ivabradin. Some patients might require mechanical life support, uh, separate support. During delivery, one must coordinate with the obstetric team. And after pregnancy, beta blockers, enalapril, and spironolactone are compatible with breastfeeding. If there's no breastfeeding involved in patients in uh, heart failure, of course, one could use ivabradin and ARNI. Anticoagulation, uh, anticoagulation by LV thrombus, if LV, severe LV dysfunction, less than 35%. One could use anticoagulation, but no acts have, there is no data at present. Uh, breastfeeding, WHO and the American Academy of Pediatricians strongly recommend, particularly in uh, low middle income countries. And the study has shown that women who breastfeed actually had higher rates of recovery. The problem comes after the patient delivers the child and the uh, uh, next subsequent pregnancy planning is an important issue. There we have two groups, those with ejection fraction of more than 50% and those who are not recovered, means LVF ejection less than 50%. This group, particularly LVF less than 50%, have very high risk of relapse and morbidity and mortality up to 50%, so they should be persuaded to avoid pregnancy. But in MK and uh, the people who have high injection fraction, they have 20% collapse during the subsequent pregnancy. So we require very close monitoring symptoms during pregnancy 
and uh, careful delivery of those patients. There's one question on the bromocriptin dosage last time during them. So I just brought up this slide. Bromocriptin, please note that this is only in patients after delivery who do not breastfeed. And the indication is class 2B. You could use uh, a short duration bromocriptin in patients with daily of more than 25% or longer course in patients who have less than 25%. So highlights of this talk are medications used to treat heart failure in pregnancy and lactation require special considerations. Severe may require advanced therapies. Subsequent pregnancies carry risk of relapse and dedicated counseling is required. Future research is required in continued drug therapy, particularly bone device therapies and genetics. Next talk was on hyperbaric cardiomyopathy with heart failure with Dr. Sanjay Mittal from uh, Medanta City gave us. These patients could present either with acute heart failure, particularly with AF uh, ventricular rate, or it could be chronic heart failure where there are different stages of hyperbaric stage, advanced burnt on phase, or restrictive phenotype. Uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction is the predictor of heart failure in uh, hyperbaric cardiomyopathy. Those who have obstruction at rest they have higher chances of progression to heart failure. Management, if there is a provocable gradient resting or provocable, the management will be of left ventricle outflow tract obstruction. Otherwise, it is basically medical management. If AF is there, rate and rhythm control and anticoagulation. And finally, they might go for cardiac transplantation. The management of left ventricle outflow tract depends on the risk of complete heart block, the operator experience in the center, and patient share decision making. Particularly if it's an elderly with comorbidities, they go for ablation. With young patient, healthy, long expected lifespan, they should go for myectomy. The messages for heart failure in HCM is multifactorial uh, and common. They have different uh, grades of ejection fraction with a bad prognostic sign. Medical therapy has less definitive role. AF is a common cause and should be needed to be treated appropriately. The heart failure onset also increases the risk of sudden cardiac death. If elevated obstruction is detected, surgical myectomy improves survival and symptoms. Then the arrhythmia induced cardiomyopathy. Professor Rakesh Yadav started with the case presentation and they told us how gratifying the results could be. It is a patient with 53 year old who had 21% TVC burden and daily of 40%. He underwent uh, Successful ablation, PVC burden came down to 1.5% and LVF improved to 55%. And this CMR shows absence of scar in the late yellow VFNS. Premature VPCs in this cardiomyopathy, they can often lead to reversible cardiomyopathy. And there are multiple risk factors for that. Tethered ablation should be considered a first line of therapy. But also keep in mind, this could be an indicator for the presence of structural heart disease. So these are various uh, arrhythmia which cause uh, tachycardiomyopathy, tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, frequent TVCs, atrial fibrillation. The basic mechanism is calcium overload and calcium mishandling. If you correct this with ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs, there is recovery of the LV function. One gets into a problem with the cardiomyopathy is causing PVCs or PVCs are causing cardiomyopathy. So PVCs cardiomyopathy usually is uh, patient is healthy otherwise. There is no prior cardiac history, global hypokinesis with early up over 37%. There's absence of scar or minimal scar burden, and PVCs are more than 10% uh, and monomorphic, and it improves LV function with the correction. So the uh, algorithm is if there's LV function and cardiomyopathy, you must not forget to explore other causes of heart failure. Once you come to diagnose as a non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy, is imperative that you subject them to a prolonged portal monitoring. You detect the arrhythmias, then use, either use ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs. The PVC burden is, of course, uh, less than 10 percent. You could optimize the heart failure treatment. <clears throat> so highlights were tachycardia, AF, PVC are known to trigger reversible cardiopathy. Uh, AICM should be highly suspected in patients without an obvious etiology. Ambulatory ECG monitors are key to screen and properly diagnose. And reversal of cardiomyopathy by elimination of arrhythmia not only confirms the diagnosis, but may significantly improve outcomes. Then Dr. Justin Paul introduced this fashionable term, CHIC, that is chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. 
is a common manifestation is the development of left ventricular dysfunction when they are subject to cam cancer chemotherapy. There is a decrease in cardiac elevation fraction that is either global or more severe in the septum. They have severe symptoms of heart failure, associative signs of uh, heart failure, and there's a decline in LV ejection fraction at least 5% to below 55% with accompanying signs of symptoms of heart failure, or decline in LVF of at least 10% to below 55% without accompanying signs or symptoms. These are the various drugs which cause uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Type 1 is basically irreversible myocardial damage, and type 2, they are reversible uh, cardiomyopathy drugs. Cardio protection for these patients, the use of cardio protection such as uh, Tex Razoxane acts as uh, by chelating iron and decreasing iron mediated free radical formation has confirmed efficacy, particularly against anthracycline related cardiac damage. This, however, is uh, self, uh, restricted to use in a particular set of patients, adult patients with advanced breast and metastatic cancer who have already received more than 3 milligram first prime liter of toxoidesin. This one study we showed that treated the 2,000 patients of breast cancer. Those who were treated with dexazoxone showed it reduced the risk of clinical heart failure and cardiac events, and it didn't interfere with oncological response of the oncotherapy. When managing this cancer therapy-induced cardiovascular function, one should not forget the ischemia because it's been shown by various studies that these people need to be under-treated with statins and aspirin. We must take care of the ischemic part or ischemic element in this setup. This is the childhood cancer survivor. It's going to be a big burden in the future. Nearly 53% of them present because of the cardiomyopathy and heart failure. So this is going to be screening of these little hearts of big problems. Uh, interventions always uh, chip in in most of these situations. CRT improved heart function and outcomes for patients with chemotherapy induced cardiomyopathy. The Matic Chick study showed. It was a prospective open level study in 30 years with class 1 or 2 way indications for CRT. 87% of them are women. They had an average of more than 15 years out of chemotherapy and all were on optimal medical therapy. LV ejection FRAP improved a related 38% over six months after implantation. 10.6% absolute increase. Benefits accrued similarly across subgroups by gender, age, QRS longer or shorter than 150 milliseconds, NYHA class two or three, and EF 25% less or more. Only one out of 30 patients treated in the study didn't have a significant improvement and no death recorded. So this is going to be a, a very interesting uh, treatment in the future. I would like to uh, mention this to the audience. There is a cardio-oncology journal by JSC, which is an open access journal, which you could read and uh, get more information. The last uh, topic was the comorbidities in heart failure, and there are plenty of them. Few of them were discussed. One was sleep disorder breathing heart failure. And uh, in patients, class 2 or 4, the formal sleep assessment is reasonable, and CPAP may be reasonable to improve sleep quality, but do not use thermoventilator adaptive treatment for patients who are in HRF. Obesity paradox, obesity is an independent risk factor for developing heart failure, but once heart failure is diagnosed, it is associated with lower mortality. <laughs> but this is no obesity paradox in HFF. The guidelines for uh, iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia is common and important for morbidity associated with decreased excess performance. And we must assess ferritin and phosphorin and treat them with iron deficiency, uh, iron, IV iron treatment. In India, there's a study which showed that nearly 70% of the heart failure patients had iron deficiency anemia. And uh, IV iron improves uh, uh, functional status and quality of life. Depression, heart failure, it is a complex relationship. It is still an underdiagnosed entity. It is common associated with worse outcomes. High index of suspicion is needed. Routine screening is validated. Question is a good practice. Proper support, stress cardiomyopathy is the only thing that can happen. And recently, uh, Cleveland Clinic reported spike in the incidence of uh, proper support cardiomyopathy 
uh, in March, April 2020, coronavirus pandemic. This is the psychological, social, or economic stress-related COVID problem. So comorbidities are frequent and uh, especially important, they interfere with quality of life. Sleep disorder, OSA is common. CPAP reduces symptoms. CAC in late stage, avoid adaptive servo ventilation. Obesity often coexists with heart failure. There is a phenomenon of obesity problems. Iron deficiency should be evaluated and treated to improve the quality of life. Depression is more common, it seems, and is less well studied. Thank you. Thank you, Ayengar, sir. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, I think uh, with the permission of the moderators, I'll move on to my talk. Uh, this is uh, Advanced Heart Failure Mechanical Circulatory Support. So uh, to be briefly introduce the topic, um, uh, mechanical circulatory support has has come a long way uh, from uh, the initial drawing board of uh, uh, the, the engineers uh, who started uh, the whole thing. Debeke uh, first implanted it in 1963 and then uh, slowly it evolved into a reality by the 1980s from the drawing board into reality. The problem as such of heart failure is that one in nine death certificates in 2013 itself mentioned heart failure as the most important as the cause of death. Today, of course, we know that it is closer to one in five. Following the diagnosis of heart failure, median survival is just 1.7 years in men and 3.2 years in women with a five-year survival of less than 50%. So obviously, we all know that heart transplant is uh, uh, the best option, but it's uh, an option only for a few. So for all those uh, uh, who are unable to get a heart, uh, mechanical circulatory support is the best option available. So classification of mechanical circulatory support, uh, basically it is classified into two types, temporary and durable support. This is from Arnal et al. Uh, you can see that uh, in between I have placed a lighter box called as intermediate. The reason is this is the first time uh, all guidelines mention only two types that is temporary and durable. But uh, Harnal et al. in uh, uh, circulation uh, 2020, he brought out uh, the third term called as intermediate. Now, what is this intermediate? Temporary is six hours to one week. Intermediate is from one week to one year. And durable is more than one year. So the intermediate has not yet found its place in guidelines. But nevertheless, it has now made its beginning because many times you need more than temporary support, but less than a year's support. So here it is for you, intermediate category. So without much ado, let me go into temporary circulatory support uh, 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 measures and options. So basically, it's for cardiogenic shock. Uh, cardiogenic shock, we all know, is a physiological state wherein there's severe impairment of myocardial performance that results in decreased cardiac output. More importantly, end-organ hypoperfusion inadequate tissue perfusion and hypoxia. So we have various definitions. We have clinical criteria wherein the blood pressure is less than 90 or uh, for more than 30 minutes with vasopressor support. End organ hypoperfusion, how do you uh, make that out? Urine output less than 30 ml per hour. We have hemodynamic criteria. We all use a CCO catheter uh, in our um, ICU setup. Cardiac index of less than 2.2 and a wedge pressure more than 15 and lab criteria of metabolic acidosis and elevated serum lactate. These are the main criteria. Now, the SKY expert committee revolutionized how to approach cardiogenic shock by dividing it into five stages. And this has uh, uh, the importance of this pyramid, as they call it, is we can know by this pyramid when exactly to institute mechanical circulatory support. So you have A, B, C, D, E. Uh, let me summarize by saying that classes C, D, and E, you have to get in mechanical circulatory support if you want to salvage that patient or else we are going to lose that patient. A and B are probably the stages where, where we can uh, manage the patient on inotropes. Intermax, of course, this is the legendary slide from Jacob Miller et al. in 2014. We have seven stages. I'm not getting into this, but we all know that for patients in stages one, two, and three, mechanical circulatory support is definitely an option. 
how to investigate a patient for mechanical circulatory support i just told you we do hemodynamic parameters cco catheter filling pressures pa pressures and so on cardiac imaging echo even a cardiac mri in a more stable patient an angiogram to rule out ischemic uh, uh, cause as a precipitating uh, reason for uh, lv dysfunction arrhythmias uh, atrial and ventricular and functional studies cpet in the ambulatory patients another important thing is if you have extra cardiac uh, uh, organ uh, involvement particularly the uh, renal and the hepatic uh, uh, function if it is deranged then you know that this patient is definitely a candidate for mechanical circulatory support of course you have to ma make an all round multi organ assessment so what are the indications for mechanical circulatory support if you have cvp more than 20 cardiac index less than 1.8 if you have a cardiogenic shock patient as defined by the criteria i just alluded to or a cardiac post cardiac arrest survivor systolic blood pressure less than 80 on two inotropes you are not able to get off bypass in the uh, ot poor perfusion uh, as well as acute rejection after transplant all of these are indications for temp temporary mechanical circulatory support more realistic uh, conditions include an acute mi with uh, post mi vsr acute on chronic heart failure acute myocarditis and now because of covid acute fulminant myocarditis as also the bridge to decision recovery or long term refractory cardiac arrhythmias and prophylactic mcs in case of high risk pci contraindications the most important thing is if you have resuscitated a patient and you are not sure of the neurological status we use a bedside eeg to define this condition but sometimes you have some beta spikes which are non specific so then we we are in a big dilemma whether to use or not of course you have to involve the neurological team to take this decision if you have peripheral vascular disease thrombocytopenia disseminated intravascular malignancy as well as contraindication to anticoagulants all of these are contraindications for temporary mcs now mcs temporary mcs is classified into left heart support right heart support and biventricular support all of us know that left heart support is iibp the impella series and tandem heart the uh, we can either do it percutaneously but in the larger ones that are currently available that is the impella ld the impella 5.5 centrimag as well as the tandem heart you need more than 24 french Uh, uh to insert these devices so you would obviously need surgical support for the right heart you need the impella r which is the rv to pa as well as the tandem heart of the right side centrimag again requires a surgical support and by we support for peripheral ecmo the impella the larger series as well as the va ecmo so all of these would require surgical support this is a snapshot of the various devices that are available all of us are quite familiar with this iibp impella 2.5 5 5.5 ld impella rp so the impella has virtually captured the uh, uh, temporary mechanical support uh, scenario apart from that we have the va ecmo as well as the centrimag this is a beautiful chart from hajar et al which was published in critical care 2019 because it tells you for the first time a totally different perspective on mechanical circulatory support which device according to how much cardiac output you require so starting off from just the iibp which offers no support right up to 7 to 10 liters per minute offered by the centrimag so this is a beautiful snapshot saying which device device to choose depending on body surface area of the patient the condition of the end organs as well as the amount of support that's required this is a short video to show you what are the devices that are available uh, in our armamentarium starting with the impella 2.5 to impella cp so this is this is placed in the lv the it draws blood from the lv cavity and deposits it in the ascending aorta this is the perfusion of the coronaries as well as the end organ perfusion axillary support is required for impella 50 it it's not through the femoral and the same principle follows that is inflow it takes out the blood and deposits it in the outflow the good thing about the impella 50 is the patient can be seated because it's an axillary approach this is a video showing the impella rv rp so this is into the ivc then you get into the pulmonary artery so it draws blood from the ivc and deposits it in the pulmonary artery you you can see alongside both systems left impella as well as the right impella next is the tandem heart the disadvantage of this is a 24 french uh, cannula that you have to use 
and the there is a 24 uh, gauge uh, uh, collector that is placed in the left atrium the uh, the the danger is when you do a septal puncture there's a there's a chance of cross puncture getting into uh, cardiac tamponade pulse cath the the good thing about this device is it offers pulsatile support to the patient you can see that it is connected to a conventional iibp machine and it can be ecg gated you can see that it's ecg gated heartmate php this is yet to see the light of the day due to various restrictions however what's nice in the design of this is it gets into the femorals as a 14 french and expands into 24 french when it's placed across the aortic valve so you can see that once it is unsheathed it expands into 24 french so it's capable of six liters of cardiac output next up the ecmo all of us know that uh, uh, we uh, we use this rut routinely and uh, we in Narandadelia are now uh, uh, doing this in the cath lab itself. This is the Centrimag, probably the best architectural marvel uh, that is now available because uh, it is able to give 10 liters of cardiac output, free floating impeller, no heat generated, no destruction of RBCs. Guidelines, uh, the important thing that I should mention here, this is from the AATS ISHLT guidelines that was uh, uh, published uh, uh, earlier this year in March. Uh, the only thing, uh, the only class one indication is ECMO as a bridge to decision or recovery, class one C, and the rest of them are all 2A level of evidence B or C. Indications for Centrimag, if you need a, a cardio patient not coming off cardiopulmonary bypass, if you need post cardiotomy patient to fail to get off bypass, bridge to candidacy decision, or even a bridge to transplant. And if you have patients who are probably candidates for long-term VAD, but uh, you're not sure, then these patients can be centrimagged. Indications for RV assist device, supposing you put in an LVAD and the RV is still in failure, you don't know what to do, put this patient on centrimag and wean off over time. Next up, let's look at durable mechanical circulatory support. The indications for uh, durable mechanical circulatory support are uh, the uh, NYHA class 3B to 4 or uh, the LVEF less than 25%. And any one of the following, Intermax 2 to 4, inotrope dependence, progressive end organ dysfunction, peak PO2 less than 12 ml per kg per minute, or temporary MCS dependence, and you're not able to wean off. Or wean off. All of these are class 2A level of evidence. B, it can also be considered in those where you want to transplant the patient, but the PVRs are high. So uh, uh, you, you uh, wad this patient and wait for the PVR to drop. Or also, if the patient has renal failure, you don't know whether to do uh, only a heart transplant or a heart and a kidney transplant. So, wad the patient, look at the renal parameters. If they get better, restrict yourself to heart transplant and also to overcome other contraindications like cancer, obesity, and drug and alcohol dependence. Contraindications, important ones are if you have active bacterial and systemic or fungal infection, irreversible liver dysfunction, neurological damage, those with prosthetic valves, untreated mitral stenosis, dementia, or substance abuse. Flow chart, how do you select? You have a patient with uh, acute heart failure, evaluate for a transplant or a VAD. Then you break them up into a transplant eligible where the donor is available without hesitation. This patient goes for a heart transplant. If they, you don't have a donor available, VAD the patient as a bridge to transplant. And of course, the category where LVADs are always the first choice are transplant ineligible, like high PVRs, frailty, obesity, malignancy, multi-organ failure, VAD these patients and save their lives. Evolution of VADs over time, it started off uh, with the cardiopulmonary bypass in the 50s, taking using it in 1963, till today when we have the Reliant uh, Heart Assist 5, which is uh, now available. The good thing is, as I'll show you in the coming up video. So generations of VAD, we all know there are three generations. First generation, large devices, subdiaphragmatic, followed by second generation, axial flow, third generation, centrifugal flow. So what is this four and five? This was a beautiful, editorial comment that came up uh, uh, by uh, Eileen Hish et al. This was published in 2017, where he said that generation four is above diaphragm. You don't need to do a total sternotomy and divide the diaphragm. You can place it above the diaphragm. And generation five is the uh, one where you can do remote monitoring. So your patient is somewhere else. You have the parameters on your mobile phone. You know how the pulsatility index is. And you can see the cardiac output and change accordingly. What we saw is the XVE. This is the HeartMate 2. 
and now the legendary heartmate 3 this is the, the probably again a beautiful design wherein you see you can see the impeller moving there's no clot formation at all no patient has developed stroke on this in all those implanted here you can see the blood flowing this of course requ requires division of the diaphragm so it still qualifies as a class 3 uh, uh, generation 3 device You can see that fantastic device with no heat generation. The HWAD, this is the generation four device, hardware pump. Beautiful thing is that it is above the diaphragm. You don't need to divide the diaphragm. So you just need a mini surgery, mini thoracotomy, and you can implant this device. So the patient is ambulated faster. There's no mechanical contact. It, it is a magnetic levitation device. So no heat generation, no destruction of RBCs. No hemolysis. You can see that it is entirely above the diaphragm. This is how it functions. And the last one is the Reliant Heart or the Heart Assist 5. The beautiful thing about this is that uh, it is placed by mini thoracotomy, as you can see. In fact, certain centers have even evolved. Uh, by just opening the left fourth intercostal space and placing it. And again, by the right parasternal approach, they are able to place the outflow cannula. So you don't uh, uh, need a big surgical division and the patient is ambulated on day two. The good thing about the Reliant Heart Assist 5 is remote monitoring. Wherever you are, you have the patient details on your mobile. Next is strategies in durable MCS therapy, bridge to recovery, transplant, candidacy, decision and therapy. I've already spoken about this. Comprehensive classification, it depends on which ventricle is supported, how long you want it. I already told you six hours to one week, one week to one year and more than a year. Purpose of support, bridge to recovery or is it a bridge to transplant or destination therapy, where it is in the body, paracorporeal or extracorporeal, generation of device, first, second, third. We also have now fourth and fifth. Drive mechanism, the XVE was pneumatic, the rest are electrical. Pump mechanism, axial was the initial uh, uh, first generation device centrifugal from generation two onwards and whether it's con uh, continuous or pulsatile flow characteristic we all know that it doesn't really matter and this is the classification of the various devices according to the need bridge to transplant bridge to recovery and destination therapy i'll draw your attention to heartmate 3 and jarvik 2000 which are now destination therapy fda approved Complications, stroke, aortic insufficiency, right heart failure, pump thrombosis, driveline infection, gastrointestinal bleeding. The nightmare for all of us is driveline infection. <laughs> Lastly, 5VAD. This is the fully implantable VAD. Beautiful technology, coplanar. All of us know that the major limitation of VADs is a driveline exiting by the side of the abdomen, infections, and so on. This has a Jarvik 2000 VAD system. You have two coils which transmit energy, and it gives you up to six hours of battery support. This is the FIVAD. This is a Jarvik 2000 pump, which is implanted. It has an implant coil ring, internal controller and battery, nothing outside. You have a power transmission belt, which the patient wears on his chest, external controller, external battery, and user watch. So the patient gets his own details about how much battery is remaining on his watch. The entire energy is transmitted by the wireless power transfer from the transmission belt. This is the first patient, Ismail. You can see him. No wires, no cables dangling. He's going to do the treadmill. And the important thing is, since the driveline exits from the scalp, this patient is capable of swimming. Lastly, I sign off with a word on total artificial heart. What are the indications? Severe biventricular failure, allograft failure, which is common after transplant, decompensated, right heart failure on bad support, massive myocardial infection, whole myocardium is soft and you can't really implant a VAD, intractable or recurrent arrhythmias, infiltrative restrictive cardiomyopathy, irreparable VSR or anatomical defects or ventricular failure with a prosthetic valve. So this is the flow chart. Please remember the criteria to implant a total artificial heart are a body surface area minimum of 1.5 to 1.7 meters squared, not for small built people. And there should be a sternal distance of uh, 10 centimeter at least if you want uh, the implantation to be done. Yes, there should be no contraindication. So if there's a 
the uh, the important thing is if you have have intermax of intermax profile 2 failure of weaning or if you have severe symptomatic right heart failure allega failure or arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy all of these form indications for total artificial heart surgical steps this is for the surgeons on board in this uh, lecture Bi bilateral ventriculectomy uh, sewing atrial connectors attaching great vessels connecting the appropriate chambers and vein off from the cardiopulmonary the bypass again a short video to show you how the artificial heart is done this is my last video and it will last just one and after two minutes the first device a by a car four valves two chambers you can see that how it works you can see it in profile small device which can fit into the pericardium this is how it functions in profile and this is how the complete comprehensive device looks this is the venous and arterial flow illustrated next up is the bivacor device really small device it has only one moving impeller all the rest are fixed parts so there's really no clot formation you can see that the middle component is the only one that moves absolutely no clot formation so it has got balancing automation so it decides the cardiac output so according to the patient's activity rain heart this was withdrawn because of technological considerations and clot formation however the new device is just released now and is commercially available beautiful alternating ejection design and you just need a mini thoracotomy to implant this device that's why it became very popular you can see how the impeller moves this is the pump unit and ultimately this is all that is there outside the body syncardia this is the legendary device which revolutionized total artificial heart for biventricular support we have now fourth generation syncardia available and of course the most beautiful mechanical marvel is the carmat device entire titanium shield four valves and two ventricular chambers diamond etched inside to prevent clot formation it has two sizes 50 ml and 70 ml the 50 for the ladies and children 70 for the men and it fits into the pericardium beautifully changes according to the activity of the patient output changes according to activity here it is in profile and the this is the drive line it exits from the scalp so patient can swim and the battery comes in two types that is one is a, a shoulder bag or a rucksack and the other one is a trolley bag so to conclude temporary mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock please remember timing is everything as i showed you the sky pyramid stage c d e is the most important if you don't have it in stage e uh, stage c you've lost your patient durable mechanical circulatory support has emerged as a viable alternative to cardiac transplant to counter the shortage of donors of course you need to select your cases durable mechanical circulatory support has evolved over a timeline into a miniature powerful pump which is absolutely noiseless the recent generation devices have no clot formation and they are totally within the body as uh, illustrated in the leviticus fibad durable mechanical uh, circulatory support is now being paired with artificial intelligence so the the the, the uh, in in a lighter vein it is said that the artificial intelligence can decide how much cardiac output to give when so you really don't need a doctor managing this it will decide how much cardiac output the patient requires in what stages and knows when to alert the patient when to alert the patient and when to alert the doctor and it will do so by a uh, uh, a message on the patient's phone so this is what's coming up in the next years this is to sign off saying thank you we made a major breakthrough we've developed a heart that runs on cholesterol so now we are running vehicles on uh, electricity but i think probably you will have the more cholesterol you have the better it will run thank you everybody for your attention that was very nice sir it's almost like a science fiction movie for everyone now thanks sir thank you dr manakar thanks nice sir if you could just uh, like uh,
about uh, the devices available in our country and the relative cost i think it will be useful for yeah. everybody yeah so uh, I, i can speak for the uh, devices that are available uh, uh, in our hospital and the approximate uh, cost so uh, if you look at of course uh, the uh, iabp i think everybody has this is i'm talking about the first set that is temporary mechanical circulatory support uh, the impella devices the impella series is available from 17 lakh onwards uh now that uh, i must add in a lighter vein that uh, my patients uh, it is licensed for use for a week so it uh, uh, if you have to break it down it's 2 lakhs per day so you, your patient has to decide I, and the family so uh, i've had patients telling me see doctor my life's not worth 2 lakhs a day so so you have to decide who needs it and when uh, apart from that uh, uh, tandem heart is available uh, by prior order only so uh, again this is uh, priced at around 12 to 14 lakh rupees and of course the ecmo uh, is about approximately about 5 lakhs uh, 5 to 6 lakh and you have again two variants you have a rental device that is available and you can commercially buy it if you need to buy it the uh, uh, the entire uh, system is about 25 lakh rupees but if you want to rent it you just need to pay for the tubes and it works out to about 6 lakh rupees centrimag same cost about 6 lakh rupees again comes as a rental and a purchase so so much for temporary mechanical circulatory support if you're looking at durable mechanical circulatory support uh, in our institute we have implanted uh, two types of devices the heartmate 2 and the heartmate 3 uh, the heartmate 2 is priced at 45 lakh rupees to the patient it's a package my chairman has uh, said that it will be purely the cost price of the device no surgical charges no icu charges no dialysis nothing uh, uh, total package is free only the patient pays for the device uh, so, the uh, the uh, heartmate 3 is priced, uh, priced at 81 lakh rupees uh, artificial uh, total artificial heart we haven't uh, implanted any Uh, we we spoke to uh, syncardia they told us it will be in excess of a crore it's likely to be priced at 1.2 crore uh, the major problems are that you need to take uh, dcgi permission to implant this and that takes about approximately i understand it takes a week by the time your patient is either dead or recovered so uh, this is where so it is hvad would uh, work out cheaper in our population sir uh hvad see the the, the dr manokar the problem with the hvad is it's a beautiful device it has only one moving part so it should actually cost much less but the problem is all these devices particularly the diamond etching and so on uh, are all patented processes so that adds up to the cost and we had a chat with the uh, isro isro space engineers if they can send a space shuttle uh, to uh, to the moon and mars and then definitely we can make an lvad so we understand that uh, uh, the elvad can be manufactured in less than 10000 rupees that's all that it costs the rest of it is all patents and uh, uh, you know various processes that the patient has to pay for thank you sir thanks sir thanks magirath very nice talk what, what is the usual mcs you prefer in your uh, we we have magirath. put in uh we have put in uh, for in terms of uh, temporary assist devices we have put in the impeller but again cost has been a really uh, major limiting factor uh, the other thing that is readily available for us is the ecmo and the centrimag so the ecmo many times uh, i take the help of uh, i used to take the help of dr julius uh, to put it in because it's a 24 cannula but uh, we have now evolved a technique where we can implant it uh, uh, in the femoral route so all that i need to do is uh, get into the femoral artery and femoral vein i do a transeptal puncture and then place the cannula in the left side uh, the reason for putting a uh, uh, left atrial cannula is uh, you need to uh, unload the left side otherwise the system will clot so uh, this is a technique that we have evolved in uh, nh and centrimag device of course uh, uh, surgical support is absolutely necessary and uh, uh, we uh, we've done many many patients on centrimag particularly those with myocarditis where the timeline uh, uh, of survival is uh, just a matter of minutes or an hour so as soon as the patient is received in the triage straight into the ot and then uh, we put the centrimag so uh, this has helped us so uh, so in summary these are the uh, uh, temporary assist devices that uh, we put Yeah, of course main uh, uh, the uh, durable mcs i've already told you heartmate 2 and 3 and th we have not done do you regularly went out the lvs uh, left yes. side yes for... you have to uh, if uh, if you uh, uh, carefully yeah, see on the echo uh, mm-hmm. there is no contraction on the le- of the left ventricle if you don't went the left side and in the first patient i almost lost the patient because i had not went at the left side and we had to do a septal puncture on an emergency basis 
and uh, i had to put in an inflated balloon and pull back uh, to uh, to uh, you know uh, to vent this patient so now we do it routinely and our recovery is excellent good and we we, we even uh, put in asd device after the uh, uh, after the patient has recovered i have one of the uh, senior engineers in uh, mind tree who has uh, gone through this process came in with acute fulminant myocarditis and uh, 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 after that now i have closed the asd also and he's doing fine that's nice sir something more sir yeah. uh, in 2019 how many cases you must have done of course 20 is affected by covid last year how many uh elbert sir elbert elbert 13 13 13 13 we we had two mortalities 11 are alive any ecmos during the covid ecmos during covid are uh, three that, three that, that's where we are busy now so <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah that that's a life saver for the patient and for you that's right I think in the interest of time, we should move on. If others agree with me, thanks, Bagheera. It was wonderful having you. Thanks, thanks, Doctor Jayashankar. Uh, very nice, sir. Thank very you. Very nice, nice talk, Doctor Bagheera. Yeah, very Thank nice. Thank you, sir. Talk. Very. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I learned a lot. Thank you, sir. Uh, Doctor Chopra, sir, please. Uh, Thanks. Hmm. Uh, okay. So, uh, good evening. as uh, the chairman mentioned what bhagirath showed was more like a science fiction but the good thing is that it is now available these techniques are now available in several centers in our country also however for a vast majority of patients these techniques may not be applicable at present because of their cost and because of lack of skilled manpower but we do need to realize that for the millions of people that we have the there is one estimate that patients suffering from heart failure are about 10 million in our country of course the exact numbers are not known the mortality is very high it is uh, one in five as you mentioned one in five admissions are uh, patients of heart failure and the mortality is very high and that is due to a number of reasons you know for economic reasons our patients present late many times um the uh, dr harikrishan showed us that five year mortality is nearly 50% in our patients so what is the standard of heart failure care in 2020 so let me take you through a, a brief presentation on this let's understand the physiology first of all systolic heart failure or heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction at present is defined as ejection fraction less than 40% this leads on to low cardiac output increased cardiac filling pressure and increased venous distension reduced cardiac output leads on to ras activation increased aldosterone levels and increased aldosterone levels lead on to cardiac hypertrophy cardiac myocardial fibrosis changes in contractile function and progressive chamber dilatation in other words remodeling aldosterone elevation also leads on to sodium and water retention edema and congestive symptoms and together these changes in the myocardium lead on to increase propensity to cause qt dispersion ventricular arrhythmias which lead on to cardiac death we also know that there is activation of renin angiotensin system as uh, shown on this i am all of you know this so i am not going into details of that there is also increased sympathetic drive and therefore all our strategies so far have been directed towards taking care of these neuro hormonal mechanisms at initially these are adaptive mechanisms but in course of time they become maladaptive and that is what leads on to their adverse effects so we had to take care of ras activation we had ace inhibitors arb and uh, then arni aldosterone antagonists to take care of sympathetic overdrive we have beta blockers and there are some new drugs which have come on so these are the positive trials in the last 20 years which have come on and you can see that there's a large number of them different compounds so you see in red are beta blockers there were other trials which came before that so they are not on this particular slide mras there are mras are in blue emphasis is shown here 
there was another ephesus trial which was done earlier and similar similarly a large number of trials on beta blockers arbs ivabradin in yellow the surgical trials in green and icds and crt trials in pink the recent trials have been dapa dapagliflozin sglt2 trials which is in blue and a very recent publication on verisigort which is in black right at the end so there's a plethora of drugs available the problem is we do not apply these drugs properly because if we were to do so we would be doing a lot of favor to our patients and that is what is going to be the essence of my presentation so we know that there's a foundational therapy consensus solved and charm alternative firmly established the role of ACE inhibitors and ARBs beta blocker trials cibis2 merit hf and copernicus established the role of beta blockers and for mras there was rals emphasis heart failure so basically these have been the three foundations of heart failure therapy in our country the data shows that while ace inhibitors and arbs are used reasonably well the beta blockers are used much less and mras even less so which is a pity because these drugs have been shown to improve the outcomes in a large number of patients with a very very strong data so i would really urge you all to be using these drugs a little bit more and why is that there's a cumulative benefit of evidence based therapy in mild and moderately symptomatic heart failure so many times there is an inertia that a patient is doing well on ace inhibitor and digoxin and diuretic why do we need to add on something so we learnt that over the years when you had diuretics and digoxin and then ace inhibitor was added on the sorry the mortality fell to about 12% when beta blockers came in between 99 and 2000 when there was a further drop and then with medullo corticoid receptor block blockage there was a further reduction in mortality so you can see we have come a long way from digoxin and diuretics to the right side and if we were to see just ace inhibitor and diuretics compared to that if we apply all the therapies that are that are available with us we can significantly improve the outcomes of our patients in recent years have seen that there are further choices available and i can assure you that there is a large number of other drugs which are coming out so we are going to have a problem of plenty as opposed to something that we used to bemoan a few years ago that we don't have enough drugs so paradigm heart failure trial firmly placed neprilysin inhibition in forefront of this particular therapy recently published dapa hf trial established the place of dapagliflozin in management of heart failure we already knew from previous trials that sglt2 inhibitors reduce the incidence of heart failure and heart failure related hospitalization and mortality in previous trials by all the three available sglt2 inhibitors but dapagliflozin has been the first trial to show that you can actually use these drugs to treat patients of heart failure both with and without diabetes as i will show later very soon emperor results are going to be out in a few weeks time and it is expected that they will show similar results very recently very seguart which is a uh, which ultimately increases cyclic gmp that was presented it showed about 10% improvement in their primary endpoints in a very very sick population so this was trial was different that they took patients with very sick population but again it is doesn't have that strong an evidence at present and it is yet to enter guidelines and then we also have evabradine which used selectively has been shown to reduce hospitalizations and improve outcomes although we don't have strong mortality data available at present so at present apart from the foundation therapy of asr beta blockers and mra we have neprilysin inhibition and sglt2 trial inhibitors which have firmly established their place so let me show the evidence for this what is neprilysin it is a zinc dependent membrane metal metalloprotease which degrades various natriuretic peptides and also degrades bradykinin and various other substances it also degrades angiotensin 
And there has been a long history of attempts to de develop neprilysin inhibitors alone or in combination with ACE inhibitors, trials which did not prove successful for various reasons. Till Paradigm HF trial, which was presented a few years back, you all know about it. And the object was to see what is the incremental benefit of neprilysin inhibition designed to augment beneficial vasoactive substances such as natriuretic peptides. So in this trial, over the baseline therapy as available, neprilysin inhibition was added on. And these patients were very well treated, 93% patients on beta blockers, 100% on RAS inhibitors, and about 55% on middle low corticoid receptor blockers. And what the trial showed was that in nearly 8,400 patients of class two to four, of which NYHA class two was present in 70%, I'll come to the importance of this figure a little bit later. Followed up for a mean of 27 months, there was a very strong p-value in reducing the primary outcomes of heart failure hospitalization. Why NYHA2 class two is important? Again, is what I mentioned earlier, that many times there is a sense of complacency that these patients are doing well, let's leave them on ACE inhibitors or beta, block or beta blockers or uh, diuretics, but when we apply evidence-based therapy in the so-called less symptomatic patients, again, there's a very sig significant mortality and morbidity benefit. So basically, it has become a foundational therapy. Basically, it is two therapies in one pill. There is Balsartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, already an approved therapy, and neprilysin inhibition, which is the new therapy. So now the foundation therapy changes. So this becomes neprilysin inhibition gets added on. So this became four foundational therapies. Then came SGLT2 inhibitors. What do they do? They inhibit proximal tubular glucose absorption, cause diuresis and natriuresis. They lower blood pressure and reduce weight. And also they are renoprotective in type two diabetes. So as you can see, 90% of glucose is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, and that is where SGLT2 inhibitors act. SGLT1 also has a role, but we are at present talking about this particular area. So after a lot of trials on SGLT2 inhibitors with canagliflozin, empagliflozin, and dapagliflozin already established their place in reducing the incidence of heart failure and hospitalization, DAPA-HF trial was launched. India also took part in this. So nearly 4,700 patients with a mean follow-up of 18.2 months. They took patients of NYHA class 2 to 4, EF less than 40, raised natriuretic peptides, and exclusion criteria were EGFR less than 30, type 1 diabetes, and systolic blood pressure nine, less than 95. Mean age was 67 years. And again, a large number, majority of patients were in class two, which reiterates the point that I made just now, that one should not be complacent in patients who don't show very many symptoms. So dapagliflozin was added on top of an excellent baseline medical treatment. 94% patients on RAS blockers, 96% on beta blockers, and 70% on mineralocorticoid receptor blockers. And what it showed, hazard ratio of 0.74, with a very significant p-value and number needed to treat was only 21 to prevent one CV death or worsening of heart failure event. As you can see, this chart shows that the various outcomes which are assessed, CV death, hospitalization or urgent heart failure visit, heart failure hospitalization or urgent heart failure visit, individually heart failure hospitalization, CV death, or death from any cause, they were all very significantly reduced. And each one of them had a p-value, which was significant in favor of dapagliflozin. If you took pre-specified subgroup analysis, that means patients who were diabetic and non-diabetic, there was an equal benefit. In this particular trial, although dapagliflozin was developed as an anti-diabetic drug, but by its unique mechanism, it does not cause hypoglycemia. So in this trial, 45% of patients were diabetic and 55% of patients were non-diabetic. And as you can see, the 
benefit was equal in both the both the groups also with a baseline egfr of less than 60 or more than 60 the benefit was again equal and whether mineral or corticoid receptors were used at the baseline or not used the benefit was equal so indicating that it acts in every group and in every kind of a situation regardless of presence or of absence of diabetes so if you com compare these two trials the large recent ones which are paradigm hf and dapa hf background therapy was present in nearly 100% of ace inhibitor and beta blocker in the dapa hf it was present in 94% and if you see cv death and heart failure hospitalization cv death and all cause death results are nearly identical so both of them showed almost equal benefit in reducing cardiovascular outcomes the drug has already been approved in several european countries in usa canada and recently government improved dapagliflozin to treat patients of heart failure in diabetics and non diabetics in india also so now the pharm the baseline treatment becomes four drugs that means asr in with naprilysin inhibition which becomes an arni sglt2 inhibitors beta blockers and mras and as i said there is these drugs are still slightly on the periphery ivabradine has its own role one should use ivabradine in patients of sinus rhythm who have a heart rate over 70 despite maximally tolerated beta blockers or who cannot use beta blockers for some reason it is a pure sinus node suppressant reduces heart rate but it has to be used in sinus rhythm not in atrial fibrillation very sigwart is yet to enter guidelines it will soon but probably in very sick patients so is the benefit of dapagliflozin additive to secubitril valsartan so this is a small sub study in dapagliflozin that patients who were on naprilysin inhibition arni or those who were not on them the uh, dapagliflozin gave equal benefit many times question is asked should you use dapagliflozin or should you use arni the answer is you need to use both so this is what the uh, now the uh, ideal treatment looks like so these are the five pillars of hefref therapy this is a slide from dr mcmurray in which ace inhibitor and naprilysin is one group beta blocker mra and sglt2 inhibitors so four pills and this uh the actually entire management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction published some time back in indian heart uh, indian heart journal so in the inner circle are the drugs which are absolutely indicated mra beta blocker loop diuretic sglt2 inhibitor and a combination of these drugs and then we know that iron deficiency is extremely common in our patients and therefore all patients of heart failure should be evaluated for iron deficiency and if that is found you need to use iv iron in these patients those patients who cannot use as arp for some reason a combination of hydralazine hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate should be given where there are persistent symptoms repeated hospitalizations digoxin has been shown to be helpful very sigwart is again as i mentioned for very sick people loop diuretics are to be used when patients are congested but also it's important that as soon as their congestion improves the diuretic dose should be reduced to the minimum possible however if congestion is persistent then one should consider adding metalazone or thiazide in these patients and as i mentioned if there is sinus rhythm and heart rate continues to be over 70 despite adequate dose of beta blockers then ivabradine can be added if there is atrial fibrillation of course anticoagulants are needed so this basically is in a nutshell about the pharmacological treatment 
So how do we sequence these drugs? Again, a question is asked, which one do you use and how? If there is congestion, SGLT2 inhibitors can be introduced first because they are diuretics. MRAs also should be introduced at that time. They also have a diuretic property. If the blood pressure is low, there is less blood pressure reduction with SGLT2 inhibition and an MRA than with sacubitril valsartan. So here probably SGLT2 inhibitors can be introduced first. And as the clinical situation improves and as the ventricle uh, undergoes reverse remodeling, the blood pressure many times paradoxically comes up and allows you to use other drugs like sacubitril valsartan. If there are issues about potassium, Neprilysin inhibition and SGLT inhibition do not increase potassium, but ARNI, remember, contains valsartan, which is an ERP. So if potassium is the issue, probably SGLT2 inhibition should come in early. And then when potassium is taken care of, you can add on other things. As far as renal functions are concerned, key issues are volume status and blood pressure, especially in context of heart failure blockade, RAS blockade. Switching to sacubitril valsartan should not worsen renal function if intensity of RAS blockade is the same and may, it may actually improve kidney function or slow the rate of decline. Small decline in GFR on starting SGLT2 inhibitors is common and subsequently there is a slower rate of decline in GFR and when they are followed on a longer period of time, they, they do much better than those who are not on SGLT2 inhibitors. There is also a question about ease of up titration because time is of essence. Remember SGLT2 inhibitor dapagliflozin at present is one dose, one step, just one tablet of 10 milligram. In MRAs, we need to uh, probably take one or two steps from 25 and then 50. And then for other drugs like ASR, beta blockers and ARNI, three to four dose steps may be required to progressively step up the doses till you reach the ideal dose. So this is basically uh, what it is, heart failure mortality. The current reality, if you see, this is uh, a publication from uh, Salim Yusuf. And if you see the mortality, cardiovascular mortality in South Asia, which includes India, is next only to Africa. So we need to do better for our patients. Drugs are available. Patient education needs to be better and proper application of the available drugs is important. And this can really be brought down to the levels that other countries do. Eugene Brunwald recently issued this war against heart failure. This was the Lancet lecture because <clears throat> he kind of was exhorting people to do better, same thing. So what is the enemy? Enemy many times is our inertia. What is inertia? A tendency to do nothing or to remain unchanged. That is, our patients are doing well. Why should I do anything? And many times we feel that there are too many drugs which complicate the matter. But remember, cancer, acute myocardial infarction, hypertension, and diabetes, all these are diseases in which multiple drugs are used. And we never complain about them. So once there are different therapies available, which put together are known to improve outcomes, we should be utilizing them. So we should not be making any excuses. Long-term beneficial, uh, there are huge long-term benefits from combination therapy. So this is a paper published just this year, estimating lifetime benefits of comprehensive disease modifying pharmacological therapies in patients with HEF-REF, a comparative analysis of three enrolled trials. Mm -hmm. So if they took conventional therapy, that is RAS blockade and beta blockers, and comprehensive therapy, which is RAS blocker, beta blocker, neprilysin inhibition, MRA, and SGLT2, see the benefit in all the outcomes, cardiovascular death or hospitalization of heart failure, CV death, hospital but, admission, but, and but call sir, call sir, Two more speakers are there. Okay, I'm finishing. Last slide. So uh, do we need to do anything more? Yes, because if we don't, our patients will suffer. We should not be complacent, and sooner we do, we act, the better it is. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, we'll quickly go for some questions for uh, Dr. Chopra. And I, got, I received three uh, questions for uh, the previous speaker. 
so that after uh, dr chopra sir answers his questions these queries can be posed to dr bagirath my question is in heart failure we always say restrict fluids the other side when you give sg sglt to inhibitors you advise this uh, diabetes uh, diabeticians always advise that they should take excessive fluids because they lose lot of fluids so uh, there is a paradox how do you balance this paradox so when we start these drugs we need to reduce diuretics and same thing is true when we use naprilysin inhibition so we reduce diuretics and it uh, reduce diuretics and it's important to maintain euvolemia so you have to find the right uh, balance between the fluid intake and the diuretic effect that means you, you know the diuretics class, do not really improve long term outcome so that means you can't give in class 3 class 4 symptom more mostly class 4 symptomatic patients you can't give this because you are going to restrict fluids there no 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 it's not like that because these people are already volume overloaded mm -hmm. you see the fluid restriction comes if they they get dehydrated in when they are class 3 and 4 they are already volume overloaded mm -hmm. so you use these drugs and once they achieve you volemia then you can gradually keep on reducing diuretics any more questions to dr chopra sir otherwise i got three questions for dr bagirath there's one question for dr chopra from dr ganesh from nashik please. please i'll just read it out sir uh, even i got that question yeah you can you can read you can read no, no problem. problem you can read it so sglt2 inhibitors appear equally effective in reducing the end points in heart failure particularly after dapa hf they are cheaper apparently have less side effect compared to valsartan cyclobutyl these are hypotension hyperkalemia and renal dysfunction also single daily dose so should we start dapa glifluzin before vimada so i just showed that uh, okay. among the last slides this particular question was answered that what should be the sequencing of these drugs Right. so i suppose in the interest of time since the slides are available if you just go back to the slide you will get that question you will get the answer <coughs> oh. can you can you answer in brief without going back to slides because in the interest so, of so time. you know if there is if there is hyperkalemia <coughs> then you need to start uh, you can start dapagliflozin earlier if there is renal dysfunction we can start dapagliflozin earlier and if there is hypotension we can start dapagliflozin earlier but the point is as these conditions are taken care of we need to get as inhibitor arv or army on board because on all these conditions can be managed also what happens is that as the heart failure improves there is reverse remodeling and many times we find that the pressure slightly comes up which allows you to use other drugs more liberally okay okay any more questions or shall we go to dr bagirath Dr. Bagirath, there are few questions. Please answer very crisply and briefly so that others also will get some time. There is a question yes, from Dr. Vaidya from Pune. Yes. Sir, what is NYHA class three B? Yes. Three B. Very interesting. So, uh, the, if you see the NYHA classification, there is only class three. Now, FDA in 2012 said specifically for HeartMate two. they brought out something called as class 3b that means it is something in between class 3 and class 4 wherein the patient is worse than class 3 but better than class 4 now there is that is a very ambiguous area so even though in the guidelines the term 3b was picked up subsequently it is not used anymore but however the guidelines continue to mention 3b so in simple terms it is something between class 3 and class 4 but if you see clearly the nyha classification there is no 3b it is only either 3 or 4 so suffice to say for the purpose of this discussion class 3 or class 4 are indications for lv next question is from trivandrum by dr tarun yes in patients of non ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy which device is good well non non is non ischemic dilate actually if you see non ischemic dilate cardiomyopathy the good thing is there's lot of space so you you have a large ventricular cavity so you can practically use any device the good ones uh, that you can use lvads are the heartmate 2 as well as the heartmate 3 now conventionally even the xve which is a large and bulky device could be used in such patients because the lv cavity size was good so in summary the answer to this is heartmate 2 and heartmate 3 which are commercially available 
uh, right now can be used in this in in this setup of patients next question is from dr ramchandra from bhuvaneshwar what are the difference between total artificial heart versus heart transplantation what is the difference in indications between these two indications okay so uh, frankly the uh, you the uh, the difference between total artificial heart and uh, uh, heart transplant uh, well total artificial heart is uh, uh, a device that's available off the shelf uh, manufactured with biocompatible materials and is uh, available at short notice uh, unlike a heart transplant which is uh, from an organ donor now in terms of the indications the guidelines are very very clear that uh, uh, you, when you put in a, a a patient for a heart transplant the pulmonary vascular resistance should be definitely below 5 and preferably in the range of 3.5 to 4 because the whole problem is that a patient when he has heart failure the pulmonary pressure start increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance starts increasing so they they go up to very high levels and the new heart that is placed when you get from a donor is is not used to high pulmonary artery pressure the the donor had normal pa pressure so when you suddenly put that into this it's like putting a 50 cc engine to power a mercedes benz it, it doesn't work so you will have a right ventricular failure now the artificial total artificial heart is a mechanical device no, so it can handle any kind of pressure he yeah. wants in, uh, indications uh, pulmonary hypertension yeah. yes uh, when when you have severe pulmonary hypertension wherein the pulmonary vascular resistance is really high you have severe biventricular failure or if you have a patient on lvad whose right ventricle has failed you put in a centrimag and at the end of 30 days uh, uh, the duration with which it is licensed for use uh, you completed 30 days now what to do next rv is not improving mm-hmm. and the patient is on lvad so the only way out and at that particular time all of us uh, know that you will not get a donor heart at all so then what to do for this patient total total artificial heart is the answer fair enough uh, doc any more questions for dr chopra sahab okay, okay. there are uh, no more questions we'll proceed for the next speaker yes. chronic uh, then valvular heart failure ajay bahel please Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So I will be uh, speaking on valvular uh, heart disease and heart failure. So basically, I'll be speaking on advanced uh, uh, valvular heart disease, and uh, it's a very vast topic. And whenever we talk of valvular heart disease, I decided that we cannot leave out clinical examination. So I'm bringing out just two or three slides on clinical examination. and the valve that i will be discussing is often a valve that is extremely important but uh, it's not really emphasized to that extent and i'll be discussing management of tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure and i'll be discussing rheumatic fever prophylaxis in advanced rheumatic heart disease that means uh, uh, what are the recent data that has come out in patients rheumatic fever prophylaxis as far as patients who have advanced valvular that means they have class 3 they have class 4 uh, or nyhc class 2 and significant valvular heart disease so clinical examination i just a couple of slides because i think valvular heart disease one has to bring in the clinical examination so uh, these are i'm discussing multi valvular more advanced patients who are likely to be in heart failure so very often there is a doubt of distinguishing between a mitral stenosis mid diastolic murmur this is a austin flint murmur so i'll just discuss this austin flint is seen only in patients who have a severe a- ar i mean it is not seen in mild ar and they are very similar murmurs both are best heard at the apex both are low frequency uh, low frequency rumbling murmurs both are mid diastolic or pre systolic or both and both of them increase in intensity on hand grip so what are the differences like on a clinical examination how do we distinguish between the two so uh, a, a mitral stenosis obviously a mdm begins with an opening snap whereas a austin flint murmur usually starts with a third, left ventricular third heart sound thrill is more common with a mitral stenosis the the duration of the murmur the diastolic murmur uh, rumble is longer with a mitral stenosis 
pre systolic accentuation would indicate that the murmur is mitral stenosis in a austin fred murmur pre systolic accentuation is often not present unless there is tachycardia or a short pr interval and of course presence of hemoptysis a loud first start sound or opening snap a presence of atrial fibrillation would go more for ms these are associated features and presence of cardiomegaly would go more for an austin fred murmur and a mild nitrate of course will distinguish between the two so how does a aortic regurgitation affect the finding supposing a person with uh, mitral stenosis has aortic regurgitation so how are the findings of ms affected in a patient with aortic regurgitation so the most important way in which uh, aortic regurgitation affects a mitral stenosis is that the opening snap is delayed so even in a severe mitral stenosis the opening snap would be delayed it would occur a little later than what one would expect in a pure mitral stenosis and of course a proximal lesion like if somebody has a severe mitral stenosis some of the findings of aortic regurgitation would get masked so the other uh, condition so first i just a uh, couple of minutes on ms with ar now what about a patient who has mitral regurgitation with sorry i, I just go back uh, so mitral regurgitation with in the presence of a severe ar how do we decide the severity of mitral regurgitation in the presence of a severe ar it is very difficult because cardiomegaly uh, will be present it can be explained by just a severe ar uh, of course the murmur of mr is a pan systolic murmur so that doesn't change so presence of a left ventricular third heart sound and a widely split second heart sound are the only two real features which can help us uh, Uh, decide on the severity of mr in the presence of a severe aortic regurgitation all the other findings can be explained on a severe aortic regurgitation alone so it's just because the topic was valvular i decided that okay one or two few slides on clinical and then i'll go on to tricuspid regurgitation and this is extremely important because what we see is that patients with right heart failure are the sick patients they are the ones who have loss of appetite their liver is congested they have fatigue they are constantly unhappy so and this is something that we should always look at and tackle it's equally important to tackle the right side of the heart whenever we are uh, looking at patients with valvular heart disease uh, it's a forgotten valve the surgical treatment it has a relatively high mortality and often patients do not receive effective therapy for tricuspid valve disease so when we talk of tricuspid regurgitation we know that it is functional in 90% of patients and what we see is that it's a high and we would call it a hypertensive tr is hypertensive but i'll come to one exception where a functional tr is not hypertensive and it is usually concomitant to pulmonary hypertension or a left sided heart disease so a functional tr is not a primary valvular heart disease it is a result of negative re remodeling of the right ventricle rather than a valve problem and like a mitral regurgitation it is a vicious cycle where a tricuspid regurgitation feeds more tr so if this tr is gradually going to increase in intensity so the one situation where a functional tricuspid regurgitation is not necessarily hypertensive is in the presence of long standing atrial fibrillation so usually when we say functional tr is due to a dilated right ventricle but in the setting of a atrial fibrillation it's not due to a dilated right ventricle it is due to a dilated right atrium and the right atrium also causes tricuspid annular dilatation but the difference is that if if it is due to atrial fibrillation it's preferentially the posterior border of the tricuspid valve that's dilated whereas in a hypertensive tr it's usually enlarges in the anterolateral direction so of course we have different causes of primary tricuspid regurgitation and the one that we encounter more frequently recently is due to intracardiac device leaks which have been used more and more frequently so whenever we have a patient with a severe tr it is very important to assess the liver dysfunction and uh, this is one of the limitations of therapy in the sense that patients who have a long standing right heart failure like we have patients with let us say fontans operation they very often develop cirrhosis of liver and that makes some of the therapy not really possible so the liver must be assessed in all patients with long standing tr and right heart failure and what we find is that the lft is of a cholestatic pattern in the sense that alkaline phosphatase and gamma gt levels are raised ast alt are normal 
and there is an increase in serum bilirubin. Of course, the serum bilirubin, unlike cholestatic, the serum bilirubin is often unconjugated. So rise in alkaline phosphatase with normal uh, OTPT. Renal dysfunction is also important in patients with tricuspid regurgitation and right heart failure because probably backward heart, heart failure is more responsible or affects the renal function more than forward failure and a reduced cardiac output. So when we come to the surgical man management of tricuspid regurgitation, we have to divide the tricuspid regurgitation into three groups. One is a primary tricuspid regurgitation, then tricuspid valve disease in patients who are undergoing left heart surgery and isolated tricuspid, uh, late functional tricuspid regurgitation. That means a person who's not undergoing heart surgery or who's already undergone heart surgery in the past, he's gone, ha, undergone a mitral valve surgery. The mitral valve is okay, but now he has presented with right heart failure and a severe tricuspid regurgitation. So these are three groups which are managed and the management strategies are different in all the three groups. So for primary tricuspid regurgitation, uh, if a patient is has a primary tricuspid regurgitation and the patient is going for a left side valve surgery, the primary TR must be addressed in the presence of an isolated tricuspid regurgitation, that means there's no other indication of surgery, the indications for undergoing a isolated tricuspid regurgitation repair is if a patient is symptomatic despite optimal medical therapy, and there's not much that we can offer in optimal medical therapy except for diuretics and maybe sildenafil, or if the patient is asymptomatic and posi-symptomatic, the symptoms are not much, and on, when we carry out serial echocardiography, we find that the RV is progressively dilating and the RV function is progressively reducing because we must intervene before severe RV dysfunction is set in. Once severe RV dysfunction sets in, let us say the RVEF goes below 30% or 35% or definitely less than 25%, then the mortality is very high and the benefit of surgery is not very uh, apparent. So, what is the surgery for a primary TR? Is it repair versus replacement? So majority of the surgeons, around 70% of the times, the tricuspid regurgitation, the valve is repaired. But little is known about the long-term durability of tricuspid valve repair. Therefore, replacement is preferred in case the valve is severely damaged and definitely in patients with carcinoid disease the benefits of repair versus replacement are still not very clear. So I think if the surgeon is happy with repair, probably repair is a decent option. The perioperative mortality for isolated tricuspid or primary tricuspid regurgitation is fairly high. And especially in the presence of RV dysfunction, the mortality is close to between 4 to 17%. So what about patients who have left-sided heart disease or let us say they are undergoing a CABG and they have got a tricuspid regurgitation. So in these patients, if a severe, they are usually treated by a annuloplasty. That is the usual procedure that is done. Severe TR will not improve after left-sided valve surgery in almost all the patients and is likely to worsen if it is left untreated. So severe TR in the, if a patient is undergoing left heart surgery, must be tackled at the time of the surgery. What about patients who have only mild or moderate tricuspid regurgitation? So here the surgical pra practice is usually heterogeneous because there is no solid evidence. There are no really randomized trials. So if there is annular dilatation, which is defined as an annulus of more than 40 millimeters, or if there's history of right-sided heart failure, mild or moderate tricuspid regurgitation should also be tackled. So in the event of, we must remember that supposing we leave a mild or a moderate tricuspid regurgitation at the time of the initial surgery, the operative mortality of a reoperation is very high. So does, uh, so, so, however, we, the current practice is mild or moderate tricuspid regurgitation. If the annulus is more than 40 millimeters, it should be tackled. But there are three randomized trials which are ongoing to answer this question. And all three trials are in mild tricuspid regurgitation, that whether it should be tackled or not. So what about isolated TR? So we are lo looking at a patient who's undergone, let us say, a mitral valve surgery 10 years back. And now he has come with right heart failure and 
we examine and we find that he's got a significant tricuspid regurgitation. So we must remember that isolated tricuspid valve surgery in the setting of a secondary TR or a hypertensive TR is associated with a high mortality, which can go up to 25%. In particular, standalone rate secondary tricuspid regurgitation after previous left heart surgery is a challenging situation. So the first thing is that surgery is reserved for symptomatic patients. That means patients who are symptomatic despite medical therapy and they've got a severe tricuspid regurgitation, but patients who have severe right ventricular dysfunction or severe pulmonary hypertension should not be sub subjected to surgery because they have a very high surgical mortality. So surgery may be considered uh, so uh, just to summarize, in patients who are undergoing left heart surgery, we even with mild to moderate tricuspid regurgitation, annular dil dilatation, we should consider surgery. And of course, now, uh, since the mortality of these patients, surgical mortality is very high, now, of course, we have multiple percutaneous interventions and probably with the availability of percutaneous interventions, our threshold for intervention, even in patients who have let us say a moderate right ventricular dysfunction is likely to go up and more and more of these patients would be, we would be able to intervene in more of these patients. Of course, there is no hard data available, but of course, with the long-term data or the uh, long-term data being available, probably uh, these indications would get clear. But right now, I think each one of these has to be individualized depending on the patient situation. So now I will go on to patients with rheumatic heart disease who have advanced valvular heart disease. Uh, just I'll restrict my talk to only those patients who have advanced valvular heart disease. And we know that benzathine penicillin is a very cheap drug. It's used very often. And uh, there, there is reasonable Indian data we have from Padmavati et al. This was in 1987. And what was seen was this is what decided our current guidelines in India that we follow as far as benzathine penicillin is concerned. And what was found in this study was that benzathine penicillin in children, four weekly gives adequate benzathine penicillin dose at the end of four weeks. Whereas in adults, uh, the, dose, the levels are adequate only for three weeks. So uh, uh, the, this has also been corroborated with some other studies like this is from Thailand, which shows that even three weekly benzathine penicillin 1.2 mega units maintains, uh, gives adequate uh, uh, penicillin levels at three weeks. So what about the different doses of benzathine penicillin? So what was seen was, this is the Kaplan study. And what this showed was that if we use 1.2 mega units at three weeks, approximately half the patients will maintain adequate penicillin levels. So, but we have to remember that there is some new data on benzathine penicillin that is coming up and this is what is worrying. And what is there in these uh, in the newer trials is that probably the patients are a little heavier. Like if we see uh, the body weight of these patients, like this Australian study, what it showed was that the mean duration of 1.2 mega units of benzathine penicillin, the mean duration where the penicillin levels are maintained above the target dose was only 9.8 days. And this was more prominent in patients who had a higher BMI. And the same study, which was uh, published in young American recruits, 77 kgs, what it showed was that the MIC was below the target levels as early as day nine. So there is a discrepancy in the older studies and the newer studies. So if we have a patient, so this has not come into the guidelines. There is no clear data on this, which is available because probably there are not many trials which are being carried out on rheumatic heart disease. But this is, if a patient with rheumatic heart disease is getting repeated worsening, I mean, in the sense that he gets one episode of failure and then he's getting recurrent episodes of failure, he's getting worsening heart disease. This is something that we can consider and maybe we can consider, consider changing the dose of benzathine penicillin because, uh, uh, what has been shown is in a meta-analysis, in a large meta-analysis, what has been shown is that the therapeutic penicillin serum concentrations in the trials which have been carried out recently 
have been there for a much lesser duration as the trials which were carried out before the 1990s. And this raises concerns about the effectiveness of contemporary secondary prophylaxis programs. So benzathine, if a patient with rheumatic heart disease is not doing well, I think we may consider making the dose of benzathine penicillin two weekly, but this is individualized and there's no real hard data uh, to, or there are no guidelines which support this recommendation. So we discussed the levels of penicillin. Let us see the clinical efficacy of penicillin. Like in the Padmavati study, what was seen was that in children, four weekly gave adequate levels of uh, penicillin above the MIC in children. But what was seen was that three weekly was clinically more effective. And both as far as streptococcal infection rate was concerned and rheumatic recurrence rate was concerned. And in another fairly large study in Taiwan, this was replicated that three weekly penicillin had a prophylactic failure rate of 0.25 per 100 patient years, whereas with four weekly, it was 1.29 per 100 patient years. So fairly efficacious, three weekly is more efficacious than four weekly. Then what about streptococcal sore throat? Use of benzathine penicillin prophylaxis reduces the incidence of rheumatic fever by around two thirds. This is as per the Cochrane database. And if we look at uh, the overall look, when we look only at benzathine penicillin, only at penicillin, the protective effect is 80%. That means the recurrence rates of rheumatic fever in penicillin alone are reduced by 80%. So, what, so I'll discuss, I'm discussing only patients with rheumatic heart or valvular heart disease who have heart failure. So I'll be discussing the indications only in, sorry, only in severe disease or post-intervention patients. So there are different guidelines which are available. So if we look at the IAP guidelines, the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and the WHO, they recommend a lifelong prophylaxis. But the Indian Academy of Prophylaxis says that we may, act, uh, we may opt for penicillin up to the age of 40 years. Australian guidelines recommend 40 years or longer. And the AHA guidelines recommend the least duration, where they say that 10 years from the last episode or at least 20 years of age. But they also bring in, uh, with severe disease, they also say that sometimes we may continue lifelong. So what about the guidelines? The guidelines, if we see, are different. In the sense, WHO guidelines, 1.2 million unit versus 6 lakh unit, more than 30 kg or less than 30 kg. The AHA guidelines, which we commonly follow in India, less than 27 kg, you give 6 lakh unit, more than 27 kg, we give 1.2 mega units. But, the, but as we have seen, the recent data is showing that the, uh, the penicillin may not have adequate doses, uh, maintain adequate doses, uh, adequate concentrations above the MIC in the recent trials. So the Australian guidelines have lowered the weight to 20 kg. That means if a child is less than 20 kg, 6 lakh unit. If more than 20 kg, then we go in for 1.2 mega units. And probably in patients who have severe disease, who are getting recurrent episodes of heart failure, who we suspect have, are getting rheumatic, uh, uh, repeated uh, rheumatic fever, we may also consider going in for the Australian guidelines. So we must remember benzathine penicillin does not need dosage adjustment in renal or hepatic impairment. So if the, if the creatinine is, let us say, 1.5, 1.8, the dose of benzathine penicillin remains the same. And the same is true in hepatic impairment. Benzathine penicillin does have side effects. The, uh, the anaphylaxis rate is around 0.2%, uh, that is 2 per 1,000. But we must remember that we are not sure whether the reaction is due to the penicillin, the components, and the role of vasovagal reactions to intramuscular injection are also important. So many of the so-called anaphylactic reactions actually may be vasovagal reactions. So I'll summarize, tricuspid valve and right heart failure is important to address in patients who have valvular heart disease. These uh, tricuspid valve isolated surgery uh, carries a very high mortality Tricuspid valve, even mild tricuspid regurgitation must be tackled at the time of the left heart surgery. Uh, it is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. 
these patients with isolated right heart failure are sick they are unhappy they are tired they are fatigued they don't have appetite and it, there's very little that we can do on medical therapy alone benzathione penicillin remains the drug of choice we must remember if a patient wants oral drugs we must tell a patient the breakthrough rates with three weekly benzathione penicillin is 0.5 per 100 patient years with four weekly penicillin the breakthrough rates of rheumatic fever are around 1 per 100 patient years and with oral drugs the breakthrough rates are between 3 to 5 per 100 patient years thank you so much now this presentation is open for discussion are you able to hear me yeah yeah see uh, i would like to ask ask you one question and then there is a very good question posed by dr jay Pra jay prasad from bangalore one after another i will will there be any gradient across mitral valve in austin fringe murmur severe ar sorry uh, yeah no no i got it no, right. no, absolutely no, uh, you are yes yes uh, no no i i uh, so just on discussion so... because many pgs uh, uh, tell me uh, I, this is uh, this has got a anecdotal uh, anecdotal uh, memory in my mind in my dm exam professor wahi your grand great grand teacher professor wahi asked this question will there be a gradient across mitral valve in severe ar that is austin trend marma so uh, the first thing that uh, no, uh, i think let your answers be very crisp to absolutely, save time absolutely. for the next speaker absolutely so uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, for that we have to go as to what is the basic mechanism of the austin flint murmur and the basic mechanism of the austin flint murmur is uh, not the ar which is striking the mitral valve because austin flint is a mid diastolic or a late diastolic murmur so it does not coincide with the aortic regurgitation jet it occurs later so one of the mechanisms of an austin flint murmur is that it causes a partial it causes a rise in the lvedp and it causes a partial closing of the mitral valve because it strikes the anterior mitral leaflet so i if if there is no significant mitral stenosis i would not expect that uh, a gradient to occur in an austin flint murmur i mean in a aortic regurgitation with an austin flint murmur accepted very good so there don't be any gradient though there is a murmur there don't be any gradient then next there is a question from jay prasad from bangalore what he says is sustained hand drip differentiate mitral stenosis with austin flint murmur by increasing the after load won't mitral stenosis murmur decrease and austin flint murmur increase kindly clarify sir yes absolutely i brought out this point because this is a very common mistake that there is a it's common sense i mean it appears to be common sense but we must remember that hand grip is an exercise any exercise increases the heart rate it increases the cardiac output so mitral stenosis is dependent on both it on the heart rate as well as the cardiac output so it's very oh, important oh, to remember oh, any exercise whether it is isotonic or whether it is isometric it will increase the mitral regurgitation murmur so it will not distinguish between ar and ms and the most question. important determinant of a mdm is probably the heart rate so if a, in a mitral stenosis the heart rate is 80 you lower it to 55 60 the patient, symptoms of a patient will improve so both isotonic as well as isometric exercise will increase uh, the mdm grade Dr. Ganesh Nas from Nasik has asked a very big question, which I think Dr. Chopra has already answered uh, about why Mada is first or dapagliflozin first. Already is answered, uh, depending upon the potassium levels and uh, sure. PFR, and already answered. I would like to skip that question. And uh, any more questions for the uh, Dr. Ramachandra from Bhuvaneshwar again asked for Dr. Chopra uh, how. Uh, respected sir how to afford financially these heart failure medications for long time so <laughs> you are right dr ramchandran but remember arni is very soon going to go off label 
and knowing the capacity of our indian companies i'm sure they're going to come out with one of these formulations at one fourth the price uh, this has happened with every particular drug and sglt2 inhibitors are not going to be an exception uh, remember empa empa gliflozin reduced ejection fraction trial uh, results are out in about uh, five weeks from now uh, it is expected that they'll also be positive and then very soon uh, there's already an empa gliflozin of indian brand available so i'm sure there is going to be a price war which we hope that will be good for our patients one question for dr ajay bahal which we keep seeing in our day to day practice people who have been operated in 84 85 87 from 80 i have been seeing in vellore and here in uh, apollo those who patients who have undergone mvr or dvr now comes back with severe pulmonary hypertension plus organic tricuspid regurgitation organic means uh, that time it is there no tr now you can't differentiate how much of tr is because of high pressure tr that is because of pulmonary hypertension and rv remodeling how much is because of organic tr and it has been shown in that developing countries tr can occur much later at a later date after the left heart valve involvement is done which there are lot of papers on berry dr gidwai and wahi also so almost they they quoted a per incidence of 22% in uh, autopsy series mild tricuspid so how to differentiate those 5% of patients where both will be there organic uh, tr mild ts plus pulmonary hypertension uh, i think it's first is that i think a very important point you've emphasized and this is the reason why even after doing a double valve replacement it is very important to continue with the rheumatic prophylaxis because organic tr can definitely occur now distinguishing between the two can be difficult in the sense that there are two aspects to it one is we distinguish between the two and if we are able to distinguish between the two will our intervention or with our indication for surgery change if there is a organic or not i think the first thing is that if the valve is not not coopting at all and we see that the papillary muscle is displaced apically the rv is severely dilated in that case even if there is a organic tricuspid regurgitation probably the pulmonary hypertension is contributing uh, or a hypertensive tr is what is contributing mainly to the tricuspid regurgitation and in the setting of a hypertensive tr probably we should not subject the patient to surgery and we should continue on medical management uh because the surgery carries a very high mortality and the second thing is that many of these patients have cirrhosis in the sense that we have even working up patients for uh, when we work up for transplant i think we have had a significant number of patients with the right heart failure who ultimately are found to have cirrhosis of liver so i would not intervene in a patient with severe pulmonary hypertension fair enough is there are no more questions shall we go to the next speaker please dr jay shankar and uh, where is our dr manokar any more questions no i think let's get on uh, okay i can't hear you dr manohar you are i could see okay uh, sir we are running behind schedule so better to go ahead with the yeah yeah please please sure sir. thank you sir. thanks dr ajay sir thanks very nice talk sir thank thanks you, a lot Dr. Anup, you can uh, proceed. Yeah. Um, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, yes. The, uh, I'll be discussing two case scenarios, and I'll try to do it quickly because of the paucity of time. And uh, what I've tried to do is I'll try to discuss uh, two uh, case scenarios, which is in tune with the uh, the discussion that was there this time and the last, so that uh, the treating physicians who are the target audience and the young cardiologists. will uh, get an idea of how to approach and how to manage uh, very quickly so the first uh, case is a 33 year old female a known case of rheumatic heart disease who presented to us uh, postpartum 45 day, 45 days postpartum with uh, bilateral lower limb swelling and abdominal distension since one month she had an uneventful normal delivery 
he was in NYC class four with orthopnea. There was a history of low grade fever with dry cough since the past one week. And because of the times that we live in, we decided to go ahead with a COVID test, which was negative. There was no history of reduced urinary output, palpitations or dizziness. She was non-compliant to medications during her pregnancy. And um, the echo that was done during our last trimester uh, showed a mitral valve area of one centimeter with a normal LV function. And hence she was told to um, uh, uh, come for an institutional delivery and uh, for, with the cutting shot of the second stage of labor. Now, if you see her physical examination, she was tachycardic with a regular heart rate. Uh, BP was 110 bar 70. Pallor, edema, and ascites was present. Her JVP was elevated. Uh, she had a loud S1. A P2 was loud with a long mid diastolic murmur heard over the FX. And she had bilateral fine inspiratory crepitations that was present. Now, with this, uh, this uh, um, uh, history, uh, I would uh, want to ask the eminent panelist what all would be the uh, different possibilities with regard to the differential diagnosis uh, for the discussion in, uh, mainly for the physicians and the young cardiologists. I would say that uh, mitral stenosis is not the cause because a valve area 1.4 would not give rise to these symptoms. So uh, I, she's 45 days postpartum, even though infective endocarditis is not in the guidelines, probably that is, we have to think of causes of worsening heart failure. So anemia, thyrotoxicosis, infective endocarditis, some other precipitating cause is something that I would like to consider. Thank you, sir. Definitely the fact that she went through pregnancy, uh, we should keep mitral stenosis far behind in our differentials. Yeah. Sorry, Satyamuthi sir is... Uh... Infective endocarditis is in mitral stenosis very, 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 very rare. Mitral stenosis and ASD, these two conditions, it is extremely rare. So, um, yeah, Nasset is as correctly pointed out by the panel, uh, mitral stenosis as the cause for current decompensation was extremely unlikely because she has gone through a, a delivery, normal delivery. And uh, we also thought the same. And the, but she's, she has come within 45 days of the delivery, considering that the differential... Pulmonary embolism. Very much possible. <laughs> very much possible. So the differentials that we thought of were one peripartum cardiomyopathy because she was within 45 days. Second, rheumatic reactivation, which could have made uh, mitral stenosis um, progressive. Viral myocarditis, whether that is the cause for the present uh, decompensation. Rheumatic reactivation all the more because she was non-compliant to treatment and um, was not in pencil in prophylaxis. Fourth, I would say now pulmonary embolism, we're considering the uh, state that she was in. So uh, let us see the ECG, um, um, her ECG, sinus rhythm, left atrial enlargement, <clears throat> maybe poor progression of our waves, but uh, she's a female. So, uh, you know, we should be, take, take these uh, findings with a pinch of salt because the lead position may also have a bearing on it. X-ray showed cardiomegaly with features of pulmonary venous congestion. Now, let us see her echo, which was done prior to her delivery. In rheumatic affection of the mitral valves with a huge LA, which indicates that it's a chronic condition. Again, short access view of the mitral stenosis and uh, <clears throat> color Doppler showing hardly any MR. Now, sorry.
now cut it short now this is the echo the echo present echo looked like this what is apparent is that the mitral valves look more tight than what it was about the, the last one was about 6 months back and but what is much more uh, evident is the contractility of the lv clearly there is an lv dysfunction the black view and the foc for and this uh, images represents the 3d images of the mitral valve the mitral valve measured 0.9 cm square and uh, she had pulmonary artery hypertension with a trv max of 41 the gls uh, which was taken uh, showed a uh, global longitudinal strain of minus 12.8 percentage which confirmed to an underlying lv dysfunction now the blood investigation parameters showed that she had iron deficiency anemia her renal parameters were normal tsh was normal counts were normal and uh, since we had um, rheumatic reactivation as one of the differentials uh, the aso and the adnb which was done was within the normal limits the crp and the esr was high uh, with a probable viral myocarditis uh, as a differential this was something which we looked into and uh, since she was a female um, uh, we thought we'll do an ana uh, which was negative so the with this case snippet uh, the discussion points which i would want to bring in uh, Uh, mainly for the benefit of the young cardiologists and uh, the physicians was uh, the stress on guideline directed medications now the medicine the uh, the medication that she should be on during hospitalization and during discharge um the, the, the panelist i the floor is open for the panelists to i personally feel in peripartum cardiomyopathy although guidelines uh, say that you can withdraw therapy if the patient improves but at least in our subcontinent i think uh, we should treat them as uh, dcm for life because unless you tell people uh, that it is for life uh, we have seen lot of patients relapsing even after 2 years of uh, heart failure treatment so i generally feel peripartum cardiomyopathy treatment guidelines has to be almost like any dcm except for the pregnancy advice that is different but other than that almost medications like enalapril and all i think we should uh, continue indefinitely because uh, i personally have seen at least three or four relapses even after five years of patients uh, stopping and i don't think so enalapril and beta blocker are expensive drugs that we should avoid so i personally would prefer to continue it for life even if the lv function improves and uh, if uh, we feel that bmv is warranted maybe that would be we should delay it maybe for 6 weeks more and then reassess maybe do a t and uh, definitely she doesn't she is not going to get pregnant that is the most important advice i would like to give to that patient i would uh, do a bmv and then assess because the mitral valve is tight the la is really large and uh, Uh, maybe her symptoms would partially improve with a BMV. I I would uh, go and maybe decongest her slightly and then go in for a BMV first. So I think um, uh, Dr. Manohar and Dr. Ajay Bal sir, both of you discussed the questions that uh, was in store. So I would first start with the uh, guideline directed medical treatment uh, in a country where less than fifty percentage of the people gets guideline directed medical treatment. Our heart failure registry showed forty one percentage. that's a good number that's a big improvement from the previous registries showed uh, gdmt so this patient should be on ace inhibitors beta blockers and mineral oils mras um, with uh, plus or minus arni arni we, we didn't consider here because of the financial state she was in we thought um, uh, better not to start and her going to for non compliance so we started off with inalapril which was 
safe during uh, breastfeeding, a beta blocker and an aldactone. And um, one uh, guideline directed medical treatment specific for postpartum cardiomyopathy was uh, the start, uh, initiation of oral anticoagulation because she had an LVEF of less than 35 percentage. And because of the procoagulant state and underlying stasis, um, many centers um, and guidelines recommend even if the patient was not a normal So that is one thing specific to this uh, patient that I would want to bring in. Second uh, question was how long should we continue as Dr. Manokar uh, told. Relapse is much common, is very common among them. Uh, they say that if LV dysfunction persists for more than six months, it's a relapse in the subsequent trimester. Mm -hmm. And if the LV uh, dis dysfunction uh, improves within six months, that is if they have an EF of more than 50 percentage, then the chance of relapse is still 20 percentage. It is because many of the patients, if you look at the dobutamine stress echogram uh, for the myocontractile reserve or a GLS, even with an EF of more than 50 percentage, there will be a subendocardial involvement. Uh, so uh, there is a subclinical LV dysfunction that is present. So the guideline uh, as of now is to continue guideline directed medical treatment after the patient improves or once the LV function normalizes for six months. Now, after six months, the, uh, they have told selective down titration of medication. That is, if the patient was an, is an aldactone or epilernone to con discontinue that first, that is inhibitors. And there are many um, specialists who feel that the beta blocker has to be continued lifelong. Now, treatment options, Dr. Ajay uh, Balsa told about doing a BMV. Um, so what do you think with an LV dysfunction, if you do an BMV, whether that will reduce, increase the LV EDP very high and whether that will uh, be tolerated by the patient? I think uh, LA pressure is very high. So uh, doing a BMV will reduce the gradient, it will reduce the LA pressure. So even if the BMV, uh, uh, even if the LV EDP goes up, you have reduced the gradient. So I would probably do that. We have done, I mean, uh, LV dysfunction in um, uh, mitral stenosis, isolated MS patients is rare, but it does occur. So we have done endomyocardial biopsies in a number of patients with uh, mitral stenosis who had LV dysfunction after the BMV, and we found only non-specific findings. So, I mean, we didn't get any myocarditis or something with these patients, but uh, I would reduce the gradient. I would reduce the LA pressure. With that... Uh... Global longitudinal shortening, minus 12. If you do BMV, patient may go into overt left ventricle failure there. For that small left ventricle, GLS of minus 12 is severe LV dysfunction. I think better to hold on, stabilize, see how our LV function behaves, then only think of uh, balloon valvuloplasty. That is my opinion. It's very interesting to hear uh, to the experts. Yeah. We all differ in our perspective. No, uh, tight. We also thought maybe BMV can be delayed because we thought the patient has gone through a, a normal delivery with that valve, although it seems to have kind of uh, worsened uh, off late. But uh, the present decompensation we thought was uh, due to the peripartum cardiomyopathy can be attributed to peripartum cardiomyopathy. So we thought we can wait for five to six months uh, and uh, uptitrate the heart failure medicines and see whether the LV improves. And if then uh, she'll be in a much better state to tolerate the increased flow was what we thought. The stenotic lesion and ACE inhibitor. You didn't relieve the mitral stenosis. Is that the guideline directed management? But here, here there are two things. No, LV dysfunction plus mitral stenosis. That, so that, That's immaterial. The stenotic lesion. Are you comfortable? Is that the guideline directed management? And there, there is a point there. There is a definite, there is a point so there. That is the one place I would probably not use an ACE inhibitor till the stenosis is relieved. I might differ there, but I might use the rest of the other medications for heart failure. Uh, point, uh, valid point, sir. But I still feel BMV is uh, too risky in this patient. Uh, yeah, BMV is definitely risky. 
because of the GLS. No, because uh, and, and we have to be very cautious with diuretics as well. Uh, whatever said and done in our setup, uh, uh, postpartum BMB and then we lose patient. Very difficult to manage the social consequences. Besides, I think here it is not just uh, LV dysfunction in presence of mitral stenosis. It is peripartum cardiomyopathy, which is playing a major part. So to my mind, I think we should, and you know, sometimes there may be a difference in assessment. It is hard to imagine that uh, at uh, term, the valve would have been 1.4 and suddenly it's become 0.9. So uh, it is operator dependent also many times. So I think here the situation is that one should take care of the heart failure first in terms of peripartum cardiomyopathy, let the patient stabilize, reassess, and then BMD can always be done in course of time. I would like to add one point to what uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ajay Bahel has said. In mitral stenosis, LV dysfunction, uh, per se because of the rheumatic activity is very, very rare. It is one of the differentiation points between the rheumatic Fever in developing countries versus developed countries. In developing countries, what they say is that it is because of the recurrent rheumatic activity can produce LV dysfunction, even in severe mitral stenosis. Other than that, in end stage mitral stenosis, for, nowadays we don't see such a chronic um, rheumatic mitral stenosis. Previously, we used to see such patients are synonymous to patients of ASD, PAH, or uh, primary PAH or mitral stenosis where LV is very small, chunky, they're going to, uh, this because of the altered geometry of the left ventricle, they can go into failure. But in developing country, in developing countries, they say 5% of the patients, mainly in children, they are shown even Dr. Padmavati series also shows, recurrent rheumatic activity can produce this type of LV dysfunction. That is because of patchy myocardial fibrosis. I think one option is that you can put in a catheter and look at the LVEDP. And the LVEDP will decide whether what is the contribution of the LV dysfunction versus the gradient across the mitral valve. Because if you have the LVEDP, you know, okay, LVEDP is 20, 15, 10, 25. You know the gradient you can calculate on echo and you would get the LA pressure. So I think that is one way you can uh, take a call as to which is <laughs> contributing more. With that kind of a cardiac shadow on X-ray, yes, I would imagine massive. that LV EDP is going to be very, very high. Very high. It is likely to be. High. And uh, we got a proof through echo. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll uh, go to the next case. Uh, what have you done? Uh, you so managed we, medically? Yeah, managed sir, medically. Uh, we thought uh, she is, we'll manage. She stabilized? Yeah, she stabilized. She yeah. was, uh, so uh, then you can. You have the option. That is what they call wa watchful waiting. Yeah. She, so she was stabilized, she was mobilized, she was uh, put on heart failure treatment. And uh, we thought our, uh, uh, the, uh, our uh, um, approach was uh, that peripartum cardiomyopathy was the cause for the present. Let us put on heart failure treatment. Let us see us and uh, ask, uh, to see whether the LV function improves. If that is the case, he's a much uh, safer candidate for a balloon mitral valve load. And uh, along with the guideline directed medical treatment, we have uh, corrected her anemia by parenteral line injection and vaccinated her for influenza and pneumococcal as well. And the most, uh, while discharging, the, the most critical step uh, is to give an advice, as was uh, rightly pointed out, about further pregnancies. Now, uh, again, uh, the data shows that um, if the LV dysfunction Versus, then there is a 50 percentage mortality subsequently if she gets pregnant again. And even if uh, LV function is normal, there is a 20 percentage mortality. So uh, deterring them, uh, because there's, there's a, a healthy baby with them now, deterring them from getting pregnant is, as a physician, the most important thing, apart from handing over the can, can you go ahead with the next case, Dr. Yeah. Make it very brief and crisp. Yeah, yeah. So I have the second case um, is I'll just tell you the clinical scenario of a 73-year-old diabetic and hypertensive who presented with worsening dyspnea and an episode of Synco. Uh, he had an inferior posterior RVMI in 2019. Angiogram then showed left main with triple vessel disease. Subsequent to that, the next case, he had a left MCA in 2012. 
uh, with uh, during that uh, uh, admission he recovered with a grade three bar five power. He had echo showed severe LV dysfunction. He had acute kidney injury during that admission. He was referred for CABG, but um, with the multiple comorbidities, LV dysfunction and MC infarct, the relatives in consultation with cardiothoracic surgeons uh, opted for an optimal medical treatment. Now, that was in 2019, June. Now, in April 2020, he was again uh, admitted with decompensation and stem. That time, he was thought to be an April fibrillation episode. Um, conservatively managed and um, echo showed marginally improved LV function. He had de novo detected hypothyroid. In July, he was admitted again with acute decompensated heart failure. His x ray showed cardiomegaly with uh, features of pulmonary venous condition. And this is uh, how his echo looked like. See that uh, the radial contractility is severely affected. There is LV dysfunction with a very calcified, um, non-compliant um, aortic valve. Opening is And uh, the aortic valve mean breathing that was measured was around 12, but the aortic valve area um, was 0.53 and with a stroke volume of 21 ml. And uh, it was very obvious that uh, we were dealing with a low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. The LV dysfunction was there and the GLS that was measured was minus 7.9%. So the, uh, this is the diagnosis uh, for us. Uh, the, it's a low flow, low gradient AS on a patient with left main triple vessel disease with severe LV dysfunction, who is in atrial fibrillation, NYHA class four, with an old CVA, CKD, and hypothyroidism. Now, what should be the according to the panel? What uh, for the benefit of again the physicians and the young cardiologists? What should be the next step in evaluation? I personally think uh, you should uh, consider doing an MRI for this patient. Uh, that would be an additional tool to assess both the aortic wall as well as uh, look for viability in the uh, territory. So uh, that will give us more information on the benefits of revascularization after this uh, delay. So it may, I, I'm not uh, predicting, it may so happen that if you are convinced that the aortic wall is contributing more you may consider doing a RV for that, or else you may even uh, do a select revascularization of only viable territories and uh, consider him. Uh, I don't think so, he's a good candidate for even transplant. So uh, we should consider whatever is uh, revascularizable, whatever is uh, fixable, we should uh, go ahead with an MRI for, and a CT so that we have a true picture of the, even for TAVI also, we need a anatomical assessment to look at suitability for it. So um, may, maybe an MRI plus uh, CT would uh, help us uh, uh, evaluate further. Thanks, Dr. Viability probably is, should be the first step. And assessing the severity of AS will not be very easy because giving dobutamine to increase the gradient, it may not work in the setting. You can't do that in the setting of a left vein with a PVD. <laughs> and also these kind of people AF I think should be addressed more aggressively than the other people so uh, many times the uh, contribution of AF, AF to the LV dysfunction is always a very key component so I think that also should be addressed so that uh, that helps us in uh, uh, getting the LV in a better uh, at least uh, uh, to an extent it helps the situation Thank you. So the purpose of uh, uh, getting on with the case, the purpose of putting this case was uh, because uh, there was a topic of valvular heart disease with heart failure today. So um, uh, this was, um, uh, and the main purpose of putting this case was to uh, uh, impress upon the young cardiologist and the physicians, the concept of low flow, low gradient AS. 
and uh, how it should be assessed. So basically, when uh, the ass was seen in this case, the aortic valve area, area was less than one. But if you see the aortic mean gradient was only uh, much less than 40, uh, uh, with uh, an LV EF of less than 50 percentage. So this is the classical low flow, low gradient DS. The next step in assessing that is to uh, do a dobutamine stress echo to see the uh, myocardial reserve. So if the stroke volume increases more than 20 percentage, then we uh, conclude that the flow reserve is present. And then the next step is to differentiate between a true severe AS and a pseudo severe AS. Now, when do we say that the uh, true severe AS is present? When the aortic valve area is less than one and the gradient includes more than 40. So here we are concluding uh, that the uh, uh, gradient was less than 40 because of the uh, L poor LV contractility. And we and when we improve the contractility, then the gradient increases. So that this very and uh, in pseudo severe AS, the aortic valve area uh, improves to more than one. That means it is a mild to moderate uh, AS to start with. And because of the poor contractility of the LV, the aortic valve was not opening well. So now once the contractility of LV increased, it is able to open the uh, not so severe aortic valves and hence the aortic valve area has improved more than one. And the gradient here but is less than 40. That is known as a pseudo severe AS. Now, more, why it is important to understand? Because the management completely differs. If it is a too severe AS, the treatment is to take care of the aortic valve. If it is a pseudo severe AS, the treatment is heart failure therapy. This is upon this point that uh, this case was presented. And uh, with the, if the stroke volume it, it doesn't increase to less than 20 percentage, it is deemed as an indeterminate A severity. And the next uh, option was, was to do a um, MDC scan to see the calcium score. And depending upon uh, the severity of the score, it is again divided into uh, true severe AS and the pseudo severe AS. So uh, we, um, as uh, Dr. Ajay Balsa uh, pointed out, we were not very comfortable doing a dobutamine stress echo because of the left main disease uh, with all the risks involved. As Dr. Manokar uh, pointed out, the viability was in our minds, but the patient was too sick. <laughs> right now, um, the patient is admitted with us. Right now, this is uh, what the, uh, the our thinking process is uh, to do a balloon atrial valvulotomy, increase the cardiac output. If viability, uh, after assessing the viability, if L LAD territory is viable, to go ahead with the left main to LAD PCI under Impilla or IABP support, followed by uh, TAVA. Um, with this, uh, I'll keep the ball open for the <laughs> to discuss and uh, teach any. Anup, why would why, you, I, would you I, consider doing a TAVI first? rather than BAV, uh, no. wait for things to improve and then do left main to LAD PCI under impeller support? No, 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 no. The, the moment they are trying to do the TAVI, they developed, uh, they will develop ventricular fibrillation in these cases. And they don't tolerate. What he is planning is correct. You can have, are you, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what he said is correct. There is a uh, what is that called? Balloon volvuloplasty, like a bridge. You love it. Uh, I am basically want to discuss a couple empty of. Calcific valve. Pardon? It's calcific. A empty calcific ah, valve. When you are able to put a uh, um, uh, bio, uh, bioprosthetic valve across, either balloon expandable or self expanding, balloon volvuloplasty should not be an issue. Even if you make a severe AS into mild or moderate AS. It is worth enough. The LV will pick up. It has been well uh, in a couple of our cases also. They have done. I don't do TAVIS, but a couple of cases also. My colleagues have done first balloon valvuloplasty. After a week or ten days of stabilization, they can take and they are taken for TAVR. I want to raise two issues here. Yes, sir. as uh, one of the panelists has already said. The moment you start dobutamine stress echo, one is patient can develop ventricular arrhythmias. So it is an absolute contraindication. Or you can put it as a relative contraindication, number one. Number two, when there is coronary artery disease, 
either single vessel, two vessel, or three vessel, particularly LAD and left main, it is like a stress test. So the whatever LV function is there, it will still go down. So whatever contractile reserve, what you are expecting, you will not find if there is associated coronary artery disease. If there is a mild coronary artery disease or no coronary artery disease, then only LV contractile reserve can be assessed. It is like ischemia. A patient, when you do a treadmill test, the LV function goes up, goes down. Patient can develop arrhythmias or left ventricular failure. So you cannot truly assess contractile reserve in a patient ischemic heart. That is one point. Second point is theoretically, in a true aortic stenosis, the valve area doesn't improve compared to pseudo uh, pseudo severe aortic stenosis. But there can be marginal increase in the aortic valve area from 1 to 1.2 or 0.8 to 1. How it is is there is something called geometrical valve area. When the LV contractility improves, the, the valve opens slightly better. So valve area can be marginally improved even in true AS, low flow, low gradient AS compared to. Pseudo severe. So, so two points I want to just highlight. It is uh, not truly that it won't increase. Doctor, I know for a word of caution, uh, you do BAV left main LAD, but uh, have the aortic wall uh, uh, planned for TAVI on table. Yeah. Because uh, there are the instances where some uh, unfortunately patient developed severe AR and uh, they had a real tough trouble. So your strategy is correct, but uh, always be prepared for emergency TAVI because. These people will definitely not uh, tolerate a severe AR. So uh, I know uh, we would all wish to do it in a staged manner, but sometimes we may not have time for staging. So be prepared for that. Then it will be a very nice case for discussion. That point we is very important, as well as uh, uh, Satyamurthy sir's point that with a severe triple vessel disease, uh, the um, uh, the yield of dobutamine uh, stress echo to Uh, see whether there is an increase in stroke volume may not be uh, the, the sensitivity and the specificity may not be uh, like a normal coronary. The viability will help you decide how important it is for you to handle the circumflex. Correct. Uh, you can keep a simpler strategy for the left main if you are convinced that circumflex is not a viable strategy. So that is additional input that you can have based on the viability study. Correct. the plan was to just do a left main to lad and salvage uh, rather than because he is 73 with multiple comorbidities we are not aiming for perfection here even uh, uh, viability if you know obviously will give us a uh, better idea but plan was a salvage pci as and when uh, if it happens and your point is very well taken dr manohar that bav with a severe ar we should always have a valve in, in the cath lab uh, uh, for a potential tavi Was it a was it a bicuspid valve or tricuspid valve? It was a tricuspid valve. It was a degenerative uh, uh, disease, sir. Even if the echo, if you see the mitral annulus, was also calcified. So it's most likely a degenerative. Uh, was there was there any calcification in the interventricular septum or LV outflow tract? Uh, nothing which I could uh, I I remembered not nothing. Very good. Very nicely presented. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the panelists, my co-chair persons, Dr. Manohar and Dr. Jay Shankar. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Thank Dr. You, Thank Chopra sir, again once more we'll meet in some other webinar. Let's see. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Thank you, you, Thank you very much. Wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye bye. Ajay bye. Thank you.